Good morning, everyone. So um, before this session, I was having an informal chat with all of you and asking you on uh, questions about what do you think humanities refers to? What are humanities? And I got some very interesting answers. So I think we can start from that question on what is humanities and why digital humanities? In what way is adding that digital going to make a difference to uh, the way we do humanities research? Now, in a sense, all of us are humanities researchers, as you know, like we belong to the field of literary studies, which is again now under the broader umbrella of cultural studies. Okay, so literary studies, cultural studies, religion, philosophy, anthropology, history, these are some of the prominent areas we think of when we say humanities. Now, um, why digital humanities? Don't we usually associate digital research with the field of computer science or with IT? In a sense, this uh, area is about questioning those disciplinary boundaries. Kind of getting you to think outside the borders of what you think of as a narrow field. Okay, so um, we'll start with a simple definition of digital humanities. All right, so um, digital humanities, this definition is taken from, as you can guess, Wikipedia. And there's a reason for taking it from Wikipedia because in general, we have been told, oh, don't rely on Wikipedia when it comes to authentic research information because you won't be sure of how good the entries there are. In a sense, digital humanities challenges that assumption. If you go back and look at the history of this particular page on digital humanities in Wikipedia and analyze, I suppose you know that you can look into the history of how a page has been edited and who has contributed what to it and all of that. So Wikipedia is not just the page you see now, there's an entire history to the different versions that the page has been over time. If you kind of go into the history of the page, you can check that out. Now, that offers a good illustration for research in humanities. Don't take something that you see at face value, but go into the history of how that document has been produced. And that history is recorded electronically, digitally. You have like an entire um, archive of the different versions of this page. Okay. And so why, why was I talking about the validity of this particular Wikipedia page is uh, some of the early pioneers of this field, some of the major scholars of this field were by nature of the subject, major technical enthusiasts. And they were the primary contributors to this particular page. So the reason people tell you not to rely on Wikipedia usually is that the experts in that subject would probably be somewhere else. They would probably not bother to update the Wikipedia page on a subject. Let's say uh, on, let's assume the classification of birds. You wouldn't take Wikipedia as the best source on it. But when it comes to digital humanities, literally this is their field of operation. And so all these scholars are engaging with digital scholarship. All these scholars are uh, sincerely looking at how the digital uh, landscape is transforming the way we do research. So they were the primary contributors to this particular Wikipedia page, which is why this is a field in which Wiki is a pretty good source to start with. Your research shouldn't end there, but it's a pretty good place to start with. Okay. So. Digital humanities, as I was telling you, is an area of scholarly activity at the intersection of computing or digital technologies and the discipline of humanities. Now, this is the part I was explaining to you earlier. Now, 
um, that's just the technical definition of it. But how does it work? What do we mean by the intersection of digital technology with humanity scholarship? What does this intersection look like? Okay. Um, using digital texts as your study material. What is uh, like for literary studies, what do we think of as our primary material of study? What do we study when we say we study literature? There are no wrong answers. Go ahead. Literary works. So basically, what do those literary works look like to us? Mostly books, right? Drama, poems, fiction. Okay. And for digital humanities, there are two ways in which this digital component comes in. A, either the object of study is itself digital text. Okay. For instance, let's say um, in a media studies research or in some kind of uh, my attempt to, you know, assess popular culture. I am trying to see which recent movie releases were mostly spoken about on social media. You all know Patan released recently, right? And so what was the conversation around that? What were the controversies surrounding it? What were people saying about Patan? If this is what is my question as a media researcher, then my um, study material would be literally Facebook posts or TikToks or like Twitter uh, posts, like tweets, basically. All these with like hashtag Patan or somebody, any of the things they were talking about. There are all these crores spent by marketing teams on promoting and trending their hashtags and all of that, right? You know that. So I would study what is the discourse around this subject and for that, what would be my primary material? The posts that people are making about that subject. So that would be digital scholarship using digital text as my material. Okay. So that's one way of doing digital humanities. The other way is to take some kind of a traditional text, for instance, Shakespeare, like we're all familiar with, and apply digital tools to the study of Shakespeare. Okay. So in digital humanities, basically, you will be doing scholarships that involve, I mean, you'll be doing scholarship that involve collaborative, transdisciplinary and computationally engaged research, teaching and publishing. So how, how do you do that? By bringing digital tools and methods to the study of humanities. Like I'll talk about those digital tools in a minute. Okay. But we'll be bringing new kinds of tools to look at traditional texts. That's one way. The other is to look at the resources that are born digital, meaning these uh, materials that you study are in themselves uh, a product of digital media. Okay, so to take that as your subject of study in itself, these two would be the primary ways of doing digital humanities. Any questions at this point? No? Fairly clear? Or like completely puzzling. No, there could be two reasons for not having questions. So fine. So um, it brings digital tools and methods to the study of humanities with the recognition that we no longer live in an age where print has an exclusive sacrosanct status. We no, no longer look at print as the only valid medium. Now. This is confirmed by so many aspects of our own daily experiences. Think about how much ebooks are accessible as opposed to physical books. You can like instantly share them. You can uh, instantly download them. While when we were students, even then, like, you know, early 2000s, 
if we had to order a, like a very decent edition of say glass menagerie we had to order it from abroad and wait for the delivery which would take like 40 days 45 days easily now though you know digital primarily first means accessibility also ease of use and any day i can kind of like ask you to search a certain phrase in an ebook and go land there as opposed to you turning the pages and like scrambling to find where we stop you understand so there is a certain way in which our interaction with the text has changed simply because we are looking at it in a digital mode right but this is purely from a kind of a user point of view from a researcher's point of view the fact that texts are digital means you can do a lot more with them what are the things you can do with texts primarily because they are digital you can subject them to a machine analysis which is not possibly i mean it, it, which is possibly uh, very difficult for you to do manually okay we'll talk about concrete examples of this as we go forward but what i'm saying is um you all know what a research question is right you're all in your ma and in some way you must have discussed this question of what is a research question what is a valid research question you can frame in order to conduct your research now in my head how i look at digital humanities is this it's like a child being given a new toolbox now that you have this toolbox you can play around with it and ask different questions from what were traditional research questions the things that were not possible for you to do when you are manually looking through a book can be done in a matter of seconds using a digital tool in that case how are we going to change the questions we ask about text that is one of the areas of focus for this particular uh, lecture okay uh, can we move forward so um digital humanities was initially known as humanities computing that was the name of the field uh, when it started now so initially this field was known as humanities computing and it focused on developing digital tools and also creating digital archives of text okay now uh, one of the primary uh, projects that came out of the initial days of humanities computing was the william blake archive you can go back and check it it is basically a complete archive of all the works of william blake and why was william blake a particularly good choice for this is william blake we tend to read him only in terms of a printed poem on the page but blake was a painter and an engraver as much as a poet and so his poetry is not just to be seen as lines on a page most of his poems were also engraved and he had accompanying painting illustrations around his poems and so that was digitized so those pictures add to how you can interpret the poem those artworks are as valuable as his poems themselves and so in that sense william blake was like the perfect candidate for somebody to archive digitally archive all the available work of a writer okay so um that is one of the complete archives available of any important writer that we have and then there is obviously something called online shakespeare you know he wrote 37 plays and like several poems and sonnets and like everything that entire corpus of shakespeare's work has been digitized now now that we have this whole 
digital corpus of Shakespeare. We can change the nature of questions we ask about it. Okay. So, um, initially, digit, uh, digitization was the primary driver of what was known as humanities computing. And then, they, when the first publication, like the first serious publication in this area came out, they wanted to name this uh, book on this subject as digitized humanities. So humanities research, but undertaken using a digitized medium or digitized text. And then they figured out, oh no, the focus shouldn't be narrowly on the digitization process itself, but on all the tools connected with this, which is why it came to be known as digital humanities. Now, some of the things we casually use every day in our classrooms, to which we don't give a second thought. These are already major digital humanities projects. Primary example, as I told you, let's say Wikipedia. Wikipedia is one of the world's biggest digital humanities projects. Because don't look at it from purely the user's point of view. Think about it in terms of the people who built it. Who built it? How? On what principles? Why? How did they bring about a certain robust infrastructure in which everybody could contribute to this knowledge? That is the history of Wikipedia. And in a sense, that tells you something about the history of digital humanities as well. And then another major, major mammoth project in terms of digitization of books has been Google Books. We all know Google Books. And so many of the books that are not available to us physically are still accessible on Google Books, okay? And then there is the almost the most ambitious volunteer run project known as the Internet Archive or archive.org if you've ever visited it. That has so many tons and tons of digitized books along with digitized, digitized archives of newspaper publications both from print and online medium and so many other cultural materials which would collapse because their server would no longer probably be supported. For instance, um, I know you all grew up with video games, right? From the time you grew up, you've seen a lot of video games. Do you remember how many consoles have changed in the time you grew up. When I was a kid, I remember we used to have this like cassette kind of thing that we plug in to a console in front of a TV and then we'd play around with like a, uh, not a joystick exactly, but the gamer console basically. And then that whole, if you think about it as entertainment, then there's no research to be done. Think about it from the developer's point of view. This was an important cultural document of that period. It told you something about what it is like to grow up in the late 90s, early 2000s. Now, we don't have the software or the hardware by which we can recreate that entire setup. So it's become a kind of a digital fossil already. Do you follow what I'm talking about? As technology increases, as I mean, as technology advances, many old versions of software become obsolete and therefore become unavailable as material for cultural studies. If you watch a movie made in the early 2000s in which a character is playing a game and you just get curious about, oh, can I go try that game? There's a good chance that game is no longer available because that software is no longer supported. You get me? So in a sense, Technology is becoming rapidly obsolete and that's a huge challenge in digital humanities. So how to preserve legacy software material, legacy cultural material. Now, preservation is like a very big concern and one of the major reasons to give a push for digital humanities because think about how museums and archives maintain texts. 
paper is brittle it will go away after a while electronic sources once you reach server capacity how much can you store so storage documentation keeping things alive and available for future research is a big challenge in this field and at a time when everything becomes a text for study my silly tweet about um being excited to see shahrukh khan on the screen after a long time can become a cultural text that somebody is interested in studying at a time when texts are multiplying like this how do you preserve the texts that are to be studied so there is a curation involved in deciding what to preserve what not to preserve and so on so all these factors are important concerns and debates within the field of digital humanities okay so they talk about increasingly sophisticated ways of handling and searching digitized culture okay so digital humanities therefore incorporates key insights from languages and literature history music media communications and the traditionally scientific area of computer science and information studies and they combine these into new frameworks how that we'll kind of like look at with concrete examples in a while okay we'll quickly get done with all these like you know technical and uh, theoretical explanations and then get our hands on actual digital humanities projects for you to see this in action for you to know how you can do research with this okay so um another important area to be addressed is the way ai is learning to imitate human language the way i am sure everybody here knows about quillbot everybody here has at least heard of chat gpt so these are software that are rapidly catching up with the patterns of human communication human speech the way we use language and trying to produce an output that almost fools us into thinking it is another human writing okay so these are some of the tools now available in front of us to rethink how we do research okay so what have the people the scholars in digital humanities done with these they use computer based statistical analysis um search and retrieval what more topic modeling and data visualization these are some of the ways in which they are presenting new forms of research now um when it comes to see i'm giving you this example of patan there was also at the same time a particular politically motivated movement going on in parallel asking people to boycott the movie okay let's say you are writing a research article about the whole political angle to who is watching patan and who is writing about it and if you want to track that activity yeah you will get the data provided you have the necessary tools but how will you present that data can you like literally individually list out this person user uh, tweeted this and like present your entire raw data to your audience no there has to be a way in which you process this data and you present it to your audience so as a research tool and also a tool for communicating your research data visualization is an important aspect of digital humanities so we'll come to that in a minute i'll show you examples of how this works so these are some of the key uh, areas of concern when it comes to uh, digital humanities as an area now how can we engage with this or what can we learn about this that's what we're going to see but one final concluding thought about the theoretical aspect like i wanted to finish this in like exactly half an hour of the first part of the talk and i think we're done so primarily at its core digital humanities is more akin to a common methodological output than an investment in any one set specific set of uh, texts or even technologies 
what does that mean it is a certain attitude you bring to the study of humanities see uh, i'll give you a very real world analog example imagine the only tool you have is a 1 foot natraj scale and with that you are asked to measure the dimensions of a building like this can you do that it's not impossible but it's extremely tedious right but if you had exactly the tools that would not only tell you the dimensions of this building but also its latitude longitude longitude coordinates its gps uh, you know picture and its uh, respective distance from different landmarks in the city then you're talking about a very different set of tools as compared to your natraj 1 foot scale right so with the change of tools your whole perspective on what is worth researching and also what is possible to research completely changes right so that is what is happening with digital humanities at one time we looked at close reading of a text as the primary um, mode of analysis you're given a sonnet and then you pardon my french read the hell out of it like you know you make more notes on it than the poet could have even thought about and then you're done right so taking a tiny text fo focusing all your energy into interpreting every comma every full stop there that was close reading now digital humanities allows you to do something that this theorist called franco moretti calls distant reading what is distant reading think of it like camera angles you know what a close up shot is but now we have drones that can take a very long panoramic shot of a building like we've seen when the earth has happened right there are drone shots of the entire building of the entire activity which no one human photographer on the ground can capture same kind of zoom out view of literature looking at macro trends in literature that is now possible through digital tools okay so i'm just giving you one example i'll do a live demo and then i hope you'll kind of like get pretty excited about this the way i am okay so these are some of the fundamental things i want you to know about digital humanities and then we can jump directly to examples of dh projects okay so um this is one of my favorites and uh, 